Welcome back, welcome back for meta-analysis and meta-analytic thinking that brings it all together. This is the fun and positive bit. So thank you for coming back again. So far, so much has been the bad news. Confidence intervals are wide, precision is low, sample sizes are too big, more than we can manage, and so on. How about some good news? Well, part of it is, I've talked about before, informativeness. We really need to work on improving the precision of everything we do to the extent we possibly can. But then the really good news is we can integrate evidence over studies, meta-analysis. And we should adopt a meta-analytic consciousness, meta a meta-analysis thinking, meta-analytic thinking to inform all our planning and interpretation, all our research. So I think the key to meta-analysis is a picture, the forest plot. You would expect me to say something about pictures, and I will. And confidence intervals make this possible. P-values are basically irrelevant to meta-analysis. So I'm going to go immediately over to um, ESCII meta-analysis. But I've been using this with first-year undergraduates for more than 10 years, and they tell me, I mean, yeah, yeah, we get it. That's right, move on. These pictures are just very straightforward, they reckon. So here I've got a simple example in ESCII of imagining six studies, all the very simplest single group studies estimating a response time, a reaction time. And so here's the first study, estimated mean of 450 milliseconds, standard deviation, n of 24, and that gives this uh, confidence interval as the summary from that study of all its evidence, all that it found in relation to this particular question. And so here we have uh, six contributions on this, and the red confidence interval here is the meta-analytic combination of those six uh, results from six different studies. Now, one of the problems in uh, meta-analysis, one of the problems with confidence intervals, is that long is not good. But long has lots of ink and attracts the eye. So we really should use weighting to counter that. And I can do that if I display by weightings. And so the long confidence interval that gives us relatively little information, low precision, gets a small dot. And these big guys here get big dots because they've got short confidence intervals. And correspondingly, in the invisible numbers here, I can see that the um, uh, long confidence interval gets a weighting of about 4% in the overall meta-analysis whereas this big guy here gets about 28%. And that's justified because of the shorter confidence interval, the more precise information it's giving. Then we have this great convention that the uh, outcome of the meta-analysis is represented by its own particular little picture, which is a diamond, a red diamond here, a jewel, just like this. And I'm very keen on this. Well, I'm keen on confidence intervals, and you paint them, draw them, model them any way you like, and I'll probably like it, at least to some extent. But this is a special sort of confidence interval identified as being the outcome of a meta-analysis. And you can interpret it exactly like any other confidence interval. But I rather like this diamond because, well, it suggests dual, something good, but also because it's a sort of stylized cat's eye. The fact that it's sort of fat in the middle and tails off is a bit like a cat's eye, and uh, that's useful, that's justified. Now, how do we combine these six results to get this one? We need a model. And most common in meta-analysis, there are many, many models and many approaches, but most commonly we think about the simplest is the fixed effect model. And if I click here in ESCII, I get a fixed effects analysis. And this is the most simple-minded, and it leads to usually a very short confidence interval. And it just assumes that every study here estimates the same population mean mu. 
But that's probably very unrealistic in practice because these studies were probably done in different countries at different times using slightly different measures and slightly different training and slightly everything else. So the alternative is to use the random effects model and that gives a longer result confidence interval which reflects the fact that we've got a fair bit of variability from study to study, haven't we? We've got a fair bit of heterogeneity between studies, which may reflect some real differences. It may reflect that there's some moderator variable explaining, to some extent at least, why these differ so much. It's not just sampling variability that leads these to be different. And the random effects model allows for the possibility that there are true differences from study to study by uh, assuming that um, each study is estimating a slightly different version of the population uh, effect size. Routinely we should use the random effects model, but the random effects model in fact has quite severe assumptions and it would be really nice for further models to be proposed and um, uh, used in meta-analysis. There are various things down here, too small to see, that estimate or measure the amount of heterogeneity we've got in our studies. This first article here is uh, a little one on teaching using meta-analysis going back to 2006, really making the point that by using these simple forest plots, uh, we can do useful things with even beginning students about meta-analysis. And this book by Morton Hunt, How Science Takes Stock, now pretty old, it's not quite a racy novel about meta-analysis, but almost. It tells lots of stories about the folks who initiated and developed the basic techniques. And it has a ton of wonderful examples of the value of meta-analysis and the contributions it's made. Ah, if you get together and produce one of these jewels, well, that is terrific. And here's an example from Hunt, the famous streptokinase example, a drug that was um, considered would be very valuable for heart attack. And back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, lots of people around the world did these randomized control trials evaluating streptokinase. And if we just look at these results, I'm sure you can't see the tiny little tick marks that represent the means on these confidence intervals, but just looking at these results, they do seem all over the place, don't they? Very great variation like that. But if we use meta-analysis, cumulatively, we get this much more consistent picture. We've actually got a different scale at the top, a finer scale, but this first line here is a meta-analysis of the first two studies, and the next line of the first three studies, first four, etc. So given that these studies are organized in chronological order, this cumulative progressive meta-analysis is telling us what should have been the state of understanding, had we applied meta-analysis, at each successive point after each study came in. And here, by the time we get down to 1977 with 4,000 people total tested, we've got a pretty clear result. And in fact, we didn't have meta-analysis applied to this problem then. People kept on running these studies for another 10 years, another 30,000 people were randomized to one or the other group, and we finished up with this understanding, basically the same result. Sure, estimated more precisely, but had we had meta-analysis back there, probably any decent ethics review board would have said, it's unethical to run another study here because you'll be randomizing half your participants to the placebo group, and we've got pretty good evidence that this stuff works, and therefore you'll be condemning some of them to death from heart attack. Even more important, had we made the conclusion then, we would have um, adopted it more widely in seven, 1977 instead of 1988, we would have got another decade of benefit. So here's a striking example of meta-analysis making a real difference in the world. Meta-analysis, people tend to think of it as an enormous operation. You need 20 graduate students and a million dollars in two years and so on. Well, some meta-analyses are like that. But you only need two or three studies to do a meta-analysis. If they fit together conceptually, it makes sense. And we've published papers where we've uh, done a tiny meta-analysis taking three minutes of the results from three 
related studies. And that's a useful overall summary of the three. So be encouraged to think in terms of small as well as medium and large meta-analyses. If you do go for a large one, and I explain this more in uh, chapter nine in the book with two examples, Harris Cooper's book, uh, up to the fourth edition I believe, the number of steps seems to increase in every succession, every successive edition. But here he has seven steps. And it's hard work. You go formulate the questions, get the literature, code the studies, decide what to include, analyze the data, interpret, prepare for publication, or oh, receive a million dollars in a gold medal. Well, uh, alas, wish. Somebody who does uh, a big meta-analysis like this and does it well with good critical discussion and good theoretical rationale and good conclusions, in my view, should be credited with a dozen ordinary papers because that can be a terrific contribution to integrate a whole research area. I've mentioned the fixed effect model and the random effects model. There are others. Doug Bonnet has um, proposed and explained and defended his varying coefficient model, which does look quite promising, has yet to be sort of taken up widely and tested in practice. There are Bayesian approaches, very promising. Uh, Frank Schmidt and uh, the late uh, Jack Hunter propose rather different models that emphasize the importance of adjusting for various biases, uh, in particular measurement error, adjusting for the less than perfect reliability of the measures in meta-analysis. And this is quite widely used, particularly in um, uh, industrial organizational psychology, differential psychology, where R is a common measure. The uh, third edition of their book has, has just come out. But there's more. Can we explain this heterogeneity? And in fact, the heterogeneity can be extraordinarily valuable because if we can find a moderator that does a reasonable job of explaining a chunk of it, this might give us theoretical insight into what's going on. So don't think for a moment as of meta-analysis as merely a bit of arithmetic to find an overall average. It can be very insightful about which variables are doing the work and can ask questions that no single study um, asked. Let's go back to... Now here's a, a play acting example where I've got, uh, I'm imagining I've got um, uh, 16 studies here, they're all estimating a reaction time in milliseconds, and here are all their results. Now clearly we've got a ton of heterogeneity. Here we have confidence intervals that are miles from overlapping. So there's a fair bit of variability from study to study here. And you might say, well, you're combining apples and oranges, you know, this is illegitimate. And it's true, you have to think carefully about conceptually what it means to combine these studies. But it also could be real gold, because if we can find a variable that accounts for a chunk of this heterogeneity, this could be helpful. And of course, I've set this up artificially, assuming that each study um, used only females or only males. And if I do a subgroups analysis, the very simplest sort of moderator analysis, and all the female groups are colored red and males are blue, and here's the overall meta-analysis, and here's the meta-analysis just of the females and just of the males. Two jewels, two diamonds. And here is a floating difference axis, as we've seen a couple of times, estimating the difference, the gender difference, at about 120 milliseconds. And we've got a confidence interval on that difference. As far as I know, this is a novel uh, development of the forest plot, but it seems to me to represent fairly clearly and simply the result of this very simplest moderator analysis, looking at a dichotomous moderator of, of um, uh, gender. And studying a moderator can be possible even if no contributory study, no one ever has actually looked at directly at manipulations of that variable. We can do it across um, uh, across studies in a meta-analysis. A continuous moderator, I'm not going to explain this in detail, but briefly the idea is 
if we've got a number of studies here of 13 or so of this nice social psychology um, meta-analysis from um, Garth Fletcher in New Zealand, and it's to do with the length of relationship and the extent to which you see your partner through rose-tinted glasses. Some very big effect sizes here. And 13 of the studies in their big meta-analysis had information about the average relationship length. And so this is really a regression of average relationship length versus effect size. And on the face of it, it seems to suggest that in the first one, two, three, four years of your relationship, there's quite a big rose tinted glasses effect. But by the time cold, hard reality is set in, 40 years, well, I'm down about here somewhere, we're down round about zero rose tinted glasses. Okay, a couple of points. There may have been no study anywhere that actually looked directly at this relationship, yet we can look at it from this meta analysis using meta regression. But, it's not experimental, it's correlational. We don't have random assignment of people to you're in the three year group and you're in the 50 year group. We haven't um, randomly assigned these studies to different points on this uh, continuous moderator, potential moderator. And we can think of um, other sorts of explanations. May, there may be a selection effect that uh, uh, the small number of people who make it out to 50, well, back at the start, they might still have been non-rose tinted glasses and those folks who are giving these means up here, those relationships didn't last, who knows. Or there might be a cohort effect. Um, presumably these papers were published in the last 15 years or something, so people down here are probably mainly college students and they were born in the 80s and 90s or something. Whereas people down here must have been born in the 40s and 50s, different world, different um, ideas about uh, relationships and so maybe cohort effect. But the point is, any moderator analysis is a correlational thing. Oh dear, I've got this cute grandchild problem again, sorry. CMA is comprehensive meta-analysis, software which is great for carrying out real grown-up meta-analysis, way beyond what ESCII can do. The last main thing I want to mention is the Cochrane collaboration, and I think this is one of humanity's great achievements. It's an online database of more than 5,000, probably considerably more than 5,000 uh, systematic reviews on an enormous range of important questions in medicine, health sciences, health policy, and so on. And these are virtually all based on meta-analytic techniques. Tens of thousands of people around the world contribute to these various groups that do these, and they've got lots of online tools and software and handbook and things. So let's take for an example a recent one looking at an important psychological question about psychological therapies for post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Published at the end of last year, 70 studies, total of nearly 5,000 participants, and it's an update of two earlier reviews. So this is a big review, and this presumably, if it's done well, <coughs> will be a definitive statement of the evidence on which therapists can base their choice of therapies for PTSD. So a very important contributor to evidence-based practice in our professional discipline. And it found really quite substantial support for the efficacy for chronic PTSD in adults of trauma-focused CBT and also, perhaps slightly controversially, to, for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, EMDR. And it found that non-trauma focused psychological therapies are distinctly not so effective. So this is very valuable information. But, now to do one of these Cochrane reviews, you really have to jump through a lot of hoops, meet a lot of standards, do a lot of things. Enormous task. And here is just one little example from their report where they estimated the risk of various sorts of biases in the various studies they looked at. So here we have percentage of red is high risk of bias, yellow is unclear, green is low, and we've got a fair bit of red here. Well, one here is the blinding of participants. Well, you can hardly blind people, I suppose, as to whether they're receiving CBT or wait list, but some of these other um, risks are of concern. Incomplete outcome data, selective reporting, um, uh, 
uh, etc. And so this led them to conclude, alas, that even though this is the best we've got, and we've got 70 studies, the overall quality of the studies was low, in fact very low, and so interpret findings with caution. When I open a Cochrane report, I scroll down to the very end, and that's where you get the dozens of forest plots. I love those pictures. And here's a forest plot, for example, for trauma-focused CBT versus control on a particular outcome, depression at the one to four month follow-up. And here we've got, what, seven studies, and we've got some variability. We've certainly got lots of heterogeneity here, and we've got an overall outcome which favours the therapy, and our measure is standardised mean difference, so it Cohen's D, and roughly, oh, it's, it's um, 0.75. So that sounds like a pretty good Cohen's D for our therapy there on this particular measure, depression on one to four months follow-up. Here's another forest plot, and this is for the trauma-focused CBT versus other therapies, for example, not trauma-focused. And the outcome measure is severity of PTSD symptoms as rated by a clinician. So once again, we've got a lot of bouncing around. And once again, we get this lovely diamond down here, Cohen's D of about 0.5. So this is encouraging. Hey, by the way, what's better than that diamond? You got it. This diamond. What's better than this diamond? <laughs> you got it, this diamond. Short is good. We like small jewels. That might run counter to your expectation. But in this field, small is beautiful. Meta-analytic thinking I mentioned a couple of times. I mentioned it again because it really is so central to this whole new statistics idea. Only part of new statistics is using effect sizes and confidence intervals for this study. But a big part of it is thinking always of the next study and the past study and how they fit together and what the next study should be to build best on what's before and to lead into the next one. And we're very clear about reporting very fully in a way that will be as helpful as possible for some future meta-analyst to integrate our work with other work. Speak to anyone who's done a meta-analysis and they probably have no hair left because they've torn it out of the frustration of these past studies that haven't even told us the standard deviation on the differences, oh, how can, uh, et cetera. So we need full uh, reporting of these things. Maybe you report your effect sizes in original units and also as an R value or a D value in a standardized form because that will be maximally informative and helpful for the meta-analysts. Meta any real meta-analysis runs into all sorts of practical questions I'm not going to discuss. But for example, typically there'll be a number of groups, a number of treatments, a number of measures. Which of those do you choose? And the books basically say, well, you've got to choose. And in fact, doing a large meta-analysis quickly persuades you that you do have to be on the ball, understand the issues, understand the area very well, so you can make good choices and give good critical discussion at every stage. It is not a handle-turning exercise. Ah, but when you find a jewel, you're happy. So my conclusions from this final wrapping up uh, section, meta-analysis, the good news section, integration and high precision. Well, you can have small or large meta-analyses. We want quantitative integration, even of large and messy literatures. We can make theoretical contributions as well as get the smallest jewels, the shortest, most precise estimate. Moderator analysis can lead to these theoretical advances. And meta-analytic te techniques are being developed further as we speak. And this is terrific. We should be looking out for them. We need more and we need better. It provides generally the best basis for evidence-based practice. And it's a key to building a cumulative, quantitative discipline. And estimation is at the very core. We've got to have effect sizes and confidence intervals, or essentially we can't meta-analyze. And I haven't mentioned p-values at all in this. I mean, who cares whether any of these results individually had a p-value large or small? What we care is where it fits and 
how precise an estimate it gives us so it can contribute to the overall thing. And p-values have had some of the most damaging effects by selective publication so that a whole lot of studies which were non-statistically significant um, don't come to light and therefore are not available for meta-analysis and so it could be that in some meta-analyses we're overestimating effects because uh, the non-significant studies were not available. So that's really the, uh, the message from meta-analysis, the good news story. Just a couple of slides to finish up thinking of the whole picture of the new statistics and statistics reform. Where next? Well, I think we're on track and doing the right sorts of things, but we need lots of developments along these lines. We need more advice and guidance and software and explanatory articles and things for using estimation in much more complex situations. And in the tutorial article, I try to point to some books that do some of that. We need much better software that puts estimation front and center. And then journals should follow psychological science or work out their own version to lead the way. Statistical cognition research would be great so we can give more informed advice as to what sort of pictures, what sort of representations are good. And of course, research integrity. We need lots of work, as I indicated earlier, about policies and practices and resources and expectations so we can all do much better there. And teaching, we need textbooks and software for students so that from the very start, people can do this very natural thing of estimating stuff. And I hope and trust that they will find this a much easier way in to our discipline and will avoid these smart students who come along and are turned off because the first thing you hit them with is this backward p-value thing and they just can't really get their head around it. I wonder why on earth grown-up people would do that. So the take-home message I've, uh, I repeat here, the eight-step plan, in particular this first step, use estimation thinking. Now, I think we've got time for, say, two questions, and now it's open slather. Anything I've talked about in this set of six sections. In the front row. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your uh, very deeply considered thoughts on these issues. Um, He's a crazy guy and he's <laughs> hooked on this stuff and he loves doing it and he comes around the world and does it and that's what retirement is, yeah. but thank you. Um, well, my question is um, on a study by study basis, I mean, typically editors have to make a decision to publish or not publish, which is a, di a dichotomous decision, which is, I think, why p-values had this sort of allure uh, to begin with. Um, what sort of standards would you suggest um, if we're only going to use uh, confidence intervals for, in order to decide what's sort sure. of publishable or not? Uh, a spot on question. I wouldn't use the word only if we're only going to use confidence intervals. If we're going to use confidence intervals. Um, I made a remark earlier that we have to be prepared, we should be prepared, it makes sense to be prepared to make subjective, informed subjective de uh, decisions about all sorts of things in research. We do it already as we select uh, models and procedures and participants and questions and so on. So I don't think it's terribly strange to say we should rely on informed uh, judgment, inevitably to some extent subjective, in, the, um, uh, in, in judging whether something is publishable or not. But this is not just a matter of assessing the outcome. In fact, importantly for research integrity, it should be divorced for that. And the best way would be to have a replication, sorry, to have a refereeing process, a reviewing process for research before looking at the data. So if you make a good rationale for studying this question, a good rationale for this procedure, these measures, these participants, these conditions, and you specify all that, a referee should be able to look at that and say, okay, that's good. And and then providing you do follow that protocol, that should be published whatever you find. And this avoids the dreadful thing of an arbitrary cutoff for something to be publishable or not. I want to tell a tiny quick story. 
You may not read or remember this book, but I'm sure you remember the picture on the cover, don't you? This is by the Melbourne artist Claire Lehman, her husband's a colleague of ours, and it's a stunning artwork that my wife and I bought a few years ago. And I asked Claire, and she said, yeah, yeah, sure, go, that was great. And it's on the book cover, well, I like it and it's great, but there's a reason. When I look at these patterns, I think, oh, there's a pattern there, oh, oh no, not quite. Ah, this repeats, oh no, it doesn't quite. And I talked to her about this and she said, exactly, I make a pattern and I break it. That's how I do this stuff. And that's exactly one of the lessons from randomness. Oh, there's a lump, oh no, no. Oh, there's a pattern, oh no, no, no. And so that's my rationale anyway, to justify having a lovely picture on the cover. Thank you so much for your attention and may all your confidence intervals be short.